Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, would you take them and open them with me to Isaiah chapter number 40. Isaiah chapter number 40. We're going to continue in our sermon series that we started three weeks ago called Spiritual Landmines. That we recognize that there are some landmines in the path of the believer that the enemy wants to set. And that if we're not careful, we can find ourselves on those and the damage can be uh, horrible. It can be really dangerous. And these are spiritual landmines, but the impact can be as devastating spiritually as a physical landmine can be to a soldier or a civilian who steps on them. So far, we've looked at the landmine of pride. Then we looked at the landmine of unforgiveness. And last week, Pastor Jason, in my absence, was very gracious to talk to you about the landmine of envy. Today I want to talk to you about one that we all have to deal with and we need to learn how to navigate and that is the landmine of fear. The landmine of fear. Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to take as our text verses 8 through 10. The prophet Isaiah begins this passage by reminding the people of God of their identity and God's care for them. Listen to these words. But you, Israel, my servant. Israel, when he calls him Israel, he's speaking about a people that he has chosen for himself. He's saying, but you, the ones I have chosen for myself to be my servant. And then he says, Jacob, whom I have chosen. Jacob is a picture of God's redemptive work. God chases us down. God wrestles with us until we come to a place of surrendering to his lordship over our life. He redeems us and he calls us to himself. And then he says, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. When it speaks of Abraham, it speaks that God is a God of covenant. That Isaiah begins this wonderful passage by reminding us that you are a chosen people that God has chased down to redeem and he has made a covenant a binding promise based on his character and nature. And then he says, I want you to remember about how God went after you. You to whom I took from the ends of the earth. And he called from the farthest corner saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. That's our identity. We have been called by God, redeemed by God, and given a covenant with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That He went to the furthest places of the earth to redeem us and call us to Himself so that He would not cast us off. This is our story. This is what God has done for us. And He says, because of your identity and because of who I am in your life and what I've done, I want you to remember this. Because you're going to need this in your life, the Lord says to the prophet Isaiah. He says, because of that, fear not. Would you say that with me? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. May God add his blessing to the public reading of Scripture this morning. And the people of God said, Amen. We all fear. And all of us need to learn how to navigate our life through a minefield of fears. When you stop and think about it, this may be one of the most fearful times we have ever seen in world history. Certainly most of us could identify that the time in which you and I live in seems to be the most fearful time of our lives. There are all sort of outward fears that we're hearing about every day. People today are fearful of an uncertain economy, the challenges that are facing your family, issues around their health, the uncertainty and the fear that comes with reports of seemingly weekly mass shootings, civil unrest in our nation, the war with the Ukraine and Russia, political corruption, reports of food shortage and possible energy crisis this summer and fall, supply chain issues, and we're all touched by the inflation that seems to be touching every part of our life. And all those things are trigger points that cause us to want to fear and to be afraid. Seems like everywhere you look, there's another opportunity outwardly to be fearful. But it's not just the outward things that cause us to fear. It's those things that rise up on the inside. So that if everything on the outside was good, 
there would still be things that trigger us to fear inwardly. You know what I'm talking about. Many of you today fear the fear of failure or the fear of rejection or the fear of your past or the fear of not measuring up or the fear of what happens if you become ill with a disease like your family members and your lineage may have had. And before we know it, we can find ourselves in this conundrum of fear. This past week, the American Psychological Association reports this, that 45% of people are reporting that they're experiencing more daily anxiety and fear than they were 12 months ago. That our nation today, half of our nation is saying that today, in June of 2022, I have, I have more fear than I did in June of 2021. And there are a lot of reasons that want us to cause us to fear. And each one of those reasons become a landmine that if you and I are not careful as we begin to navigate our life, we can find ourselves stepping on them and its power and its destructive realities are for sure. The Bible has a lot to say about our fears. The Bible says that fear torments, which means it causes suffering and anxiety. Have you ever been so afraid that you haven't been able to move? Haven't been able to sleep? That it began to lock you down that you couldn't hardly function in life? Did you lay awake last night worried about something or someone? Are you worried about what this week holds or this month holds? You're not alone but you're in the right place this morning because God has a message for us as His people that we are a people who can live in victory over fear and that by His Spirit He can navigate us around these landmines of fear that the evil one would love for us to get planted on and bring destruction into our life. So let's talk about fear and what it is its consequences and what we can do to begin to live victorious in Christ over this landmine. First of all, let's define fear. A mistake we sometimes make is that we assume that all fear is bad. But it's not. There's actually some good fear that God gives us for self-preservation. It's that fear that makes us cautious and keeps us from reaching into a fire or approaching a wild animal, or seeing a snake and saying, I think I'll pick that guy up. He gave me a substantial fear of snakes because the best snake is a... Apparently, you know what I'm talking about. So that's a good fear. It keeps us from harming ourselves and others, typically. There is a great fear that we can have. And that fear is the fear of the Lord. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 17, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if we want to grow in the wisdom of God, it begins by fearing the Lord. And we need to understand what that word fear means in that context. It doesn't mean to dread or to cower away from, but it means to honor, it means to respect, it means to stand in awe of the greatness and the wonder and the grandeur of who our God is and that we honor His righteousness and His character and His personhood and His sovereignty that rules and reigns over all things and we stand in fear of the Lord that says, God, you're awesome. But I don't want to talk about that this morning, though it is a worthy subject. I want to talk about that fear that is that disabling fear. Let me give you a definition. Now, on your notes this morning, we had a little bit of an issue in the office that we didn't get these done and filled out. So you're going to have to fill in all the sentences today, all right? But you're a smart group. You can figure that out. Let me give you this definition of fear. What is fear? It's that uneasy feeling, that feeling of dread. It's a feeling of an alarm warning us. It's this feeling of being threatened by something or someone. It's that, it's that emotion that brings anxiety, that wants us to lock down and be stuck. 
it wears on us. And as the Bible says, it torments us. And I want you to know this, and I want to make a strong statement here. And I don't think I can overstate this. I want you to know this. This type of fear is in no means from God. For the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a stable mind. God does not want His people living in this unchecked, uncontrolled, dominating fear that causes us to cower and to, and to dread and to worry and to wring our hands. Because when we allow fear to drive our lives, its consequences are devastating. Let me give you a few. You can jot these down. When you and I allow fear to dominate and domineer our life, here's the first thing that happens. It will always block my spiritual growth in the Lord. When I allow fear to dominate and rule and reign in my life, it's going to block my spiritual growth in the Lord. Because my growth in the Lord is going to be dependent on my trust in the Lord. And when I'm allowing fear, fear to drive the bus, if I'm allowing fear to determine my direction and set my course, then I'm not allowing the Lord to. So when we allow fear to dominate, it means we're going to have blockage in our spiritual growth. Number two, it means this. A consequence is fear causes indecision in our life. You ever been around someone who just can't make a decision? Some of you are thinking about that. Well, you know and the reason they live in this indecisiveness is because well what if I make the wrong mistake what if, what if something goes wrong if I do that and, and then they even spiritualize it as Christians what if this isn't God's will what if I miss the plan of God and we sort of frame it in that context when in reality all it is is fear trying to get us to stop in our journey with Him. Can I remind us all that the metaphor we're given in the Scripture over and over is that the Christian life is a walk with the Lord and in the Lord. And fear causes indecision by which we now just procrastinate and we wait and we wait incessantly. Here's number three. Fear affects our physical health. Fear and anxiety affects our physical health. We know this medically. It's linked to cardiovascular disease, hypertension, skin disorders, headaches. It causes sleeplessness. And when you're not sleeping well and you're not resting well and you're not renewed by what God gives us in sweet sleep as the scriptures call it, it, it leads us to this next one. It begins to hinder our relationship with others. Why? Because you're, you're always just in a, in a wad of anxiety and nerves. You're not sleeping well. You're grouchy. You're fussy. And no one really wants to be around you. Can you say amen about someone you know? It begins to hinder our relationships. When I'm fearful, just not of the things outwardly, but when I'm fearful of failure or I'm fearful of rejection... And I allow that to dominate, and that becomes a landmine in my life instead of me being vulnerable and transparent and open and engaged in relationships with my wife, with my children, with my parents, with my church, with my friends, with my employers. What it does is it builds up this wall, this barrier. And God has not called us to live as monks in isolation, but he's called us into the community by which we lay our soul before one another, bearing one another's burdens, lifting one another up, and strengthening us. But when I allow fear to drive my decisions, it's going to begin to hinder all my other relationships. Number five is this. Fear enslaves us with a feeling of uncertainty. It enslaves us with a feeling of uncertainty. Last week, I had the privilege of going up uh, to Indianapolis, and I was able to go to the Indy 500. It's one of those bucket list items. And while I was there, one of our young men who was raised in the church, Jack Culp, has graduated from college, and he got on with a great company, an ag 
chemical company and I met up with him and we had uh, dinner together and I said hey Jack how are you like in Indianapolis he goes I'm, I'm, I'm struggling I said why is that he says it's the coldest place I've ever lived I said babe you've only lived in Athens what do you mean of course it's the coldest place if you move to Nashville you could say the same thing if you move to Gainesville Georgia you and he says you know sometimes in the morning when I come out it would be so cold wouldn't get above single digits and, and there'd just be ice on the ground. And he says, I'm just not very good at walking on ice. And I said, I would give a lot of money to watch that, Jack. I, I, I just, but that's what, you know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, you're, you're kind of just doing this. And people that live in fear, it's like they're walking on ice. You're never really certain of your next step. You're not really certain. You don't have a good foothold. And, and, and what you're trying to do more than anything is not to get from point A to point B. You're doing all you can to keep from simply falling. So your energy is not spent on moving forward to your goal. All your energy is spent on trying to manage the uncertainty of that. And when fear dominates our life, that's what our life becomes. And let me tell you, that fear will keep us from living in God's best. Fear will keep you from living in God's very best. God's best for you is love, joy, peace, and the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen this morning? Finally, God's fear's goal is this, to dominate every area of your life. Fear is not one of those things that says, well, if I can only have 10% of you, I'll take 10%. Fear is not one of those things that says, I'll be satisfied if I can get you to fear 45% of the time of your life. No, fear is determined to own everything and dominate everything in your life. It will not be satisfied. And if we're not careful, it begins to dominate us immensely. And for some of us this morning, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because inwardly, you're even wringing your, your hands about this message. Because now there's this fear that, once again, you don't even measure up as a Christian. You don't even live your life successfully as a Christian. And once again, you're a failure. And this message is even causing you to fear. But I want you to pause and stop that thought for just a moment. Because what we discover in nearly every example that we're given by men and women of the Scripture, God had to deal with their fear issue. Matter of fact, did you know this? Did you know that the first words that man ever spoke to God that are recorded in the Scripture... Or, I was afraid. I heard your voice and I was afraid. The first words that man spoke to God recorded in the scripture. And from that point, God had to deal with fear over and over and over and over again. When he called Abraham, he said, Abraham, don't be afraid. I'm going to lead you to a new land. When he called Moses, Moses says, I can't do this. God, I have this stuttering issue. I've got all these, these, these problems in my life. And God says to him, I don't want you to be afraid, Moses. I will be with you. When it was Joshua's turn to lead, even though Joshua didn't say, I was afraid, you do not have to take a deep theological leap of assumption here. When in the first chapter of Joshua, God has to tell Joshua, do not be afraid. Be of good courage. I'm with you. I believe Joshua is probably shaking there in his boots. I believe he was a little angry anxious about what was ahead of him and God had to remind him over what about Gideon Gideon said God I'm the least of the most people of the least of the least of the people of my tribe who am I I can't do this and God says Gideon don't be afraid and you can go on you can go to the New Testament Mary the mother of Jesus the first words Gabriel said to her was do not be afraid and on the day of the resurrection what did Jesus say to his disciples do not be afraid it is I matter of fact fact you ought to write this down somewhere that somewhere between between 365 and 400 times in your Bible, depending on the translation, the Bible says, do not fear or do not be afraid. It is the most often given command in all of the Scripture by far. Why would God be telling us over and over and over and over again not to fear and not to be afraid? Because you and I have the propensity to fear. Fear has a way of wanting to creep into our life and land in our life. And chip away at our faith in our God. Begin to be destructive to our emotional health, our physical health, our relationships with others. But there is good news today. 
we can take those promises that the Lord has given us throughout the text and we can apply them every day of our life. For each day of the year, there is a do not fear available to you. There is a message God has for you today and it is do not fear fear and his message tomorrow will be the same do not fear and next week it'll be the same do not fear and when we run out of days in this year the beginning of next year of January 1 2023 the message will be the same do not fear why because I am with you so the question becomes Tony how can I overcome how can I manage how can I how can I begin to live in victory in this let me give you three Three, listen, listen, I want, I want to preface this. Don't, don't, don't miss me on this. I want to give you three simple steps. And they are so simple. What you're going to want to do is dial out and say, yeah, never mind, that ain't going to work. But I'm going to give you these three simple truths. And then I'm going to show them to you in an example that Christ gives us. Because maybe one of the lies the enemy tells us is this. To get out from under all this fear, it's going to take at least a master's degree in divinity and an advanced degree in psychology. Because this is deep. And it just compounds your fear. Here are the three little things I want you to share. Profound and power. Number one, acknowledge fear's presence in your life to the Lord. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge. God, I'm afraid of this. God, I'm afraid of what's going on in the world. God, I'm fearful of my health. I'm, I'm fearful of what the doctor might say. I'm fearful for the, the world that my children are being raised in. God, I'm fearful, God, of, of my own insecurities, of not measuring. I'm, acknowledge it. It seems like to me sometimes Christians are the biggest liars to themselves and even to God. That we have this hard time just acknowledging our own frailty, our own need, our, our, our own cry for help. It reminds me of those three preachers that died and went to hell. It was a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a name it, claim it guy. And while they're standing in hell one day trying to sort out what happened, the Presbyterian guy asked the Baptist guy, how in the world did you end up here? And the Baptist preacher said, well, I guess I wasn't completely sincere when I said the Lord's... Uh, uh, prayer in inviting him into my life. And he says, well, what about you? You're a Presbyterian. How did you end up here? He said, well, I guess it just wasn't preordained for me to be in heaven. They look over to the guy who's a name and claim it. He looks back at them and says, I don't know what you're looking at, but this ain't hell and I'm not hot. <laughs> you know, every now and then we just have to be honest enough to say, God, I am struggling with this. Lord, I need your help in this. We need to share that with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm very fearful about the economy. I'm very fearful about whatever that might be. Number two is this. Identify what's causing that fear in your life. Ask God to help you through the Holy Spirit to identify what's causing this fear in your life. There's a lot of things that could be causing it. It could be because something happened in your past. One of the great gifts God gives us is He gives us the ability to remember. And coming with the ability to remember is the ability to project into the future. Right? I remembered last weekend I had a great time at the Indianapolis 500. So I want to project into how great it would be to go next year as well. I'm remembering that and I'm projecting that. I remember how great it was to go on vacation with the family last year at the beach. So I can begin to have hope and expectation and excitement. And I can begin to plan towards a future because I remembered something that allows me to project. But there's also a problem with that. When something goes bad in my life, when someone hurts me, when someone disappoints me, when, when something goes wrong and I lose my job, 
or the doctor's report went bad on mama and this is how it went for mom therefore I'm going to project that on me well because it happened to mom I'll remember that and I'll remember what happened in her life that's going to happen to me and the next thing we know we're projecting things in our life that are not assumed and should not be assumed it could be something that we learned fear is oftentimes learned in our life I remember one pastor telling me that that for years he struggled with getting around water because as a child growing up, his mother would always say, don't get around that water, you'll drown. Don't get around the water, you'll drown. He said, so I, just, I was just raised with this idea that water is bad and being in water is how you die. Sometimes it's just ignorance that causes us to fear. Sometimes I meet Christians who are so fearful of their own salvation. They have no confidence in it. They believe that the Lord Jesus died and rose again and they recognize they're a sinner and they call upon His name for salvation. But then they had a bad week. Then they said some things they shouldn't have said that doesn't line up with what a Christian should look like. And the first thing they think is, well, I'm not saved apparently. I must be going to hell again. And they again find themselves in this fearful cycle of every time they make a mistake, and every time they, they fall short and every time things don't go well in their life, well, I must not be saved. God's grace must not be sufficient for me. That fear is based on ignorance. Because if we got rooted and grounded in the Scripture, we would know that we're saved by grace and we're kept by grace by the Holy Spirit that seals us to the day of redemption. And when He saves us, He saves us to the uttermost. Am I preaching to the right church this morning? Now, you can live in fear that I'm going to hell even as a Christian, but you don't have to. You can overcome that by getting into the truth of God's Word and being rooted and grounded in that truth. And here's the third thing. Not only do you have to acknowledge it, not only should you ask God to help you identify it so you can begin to deal with it, number three, you've got to change your focus. When you're fearful, and when I'm fearful, we tend to exalt that which is causing our anxiety. All of a sudden, that issue becomes the massive issue. It becomes the Everest of our own life. It becomes the giant that we can't slaughter. It's, it's something, and it begins to, to consume us at all times. We go to bed thinking about it. We wake up thinking about it. We stress about it driving to work. It's just dominating, and because the more we focus on it, the larger it seems to get over and over and over in our life. So we change our attention not from something, but to someone. Now take your Bibles, John, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. You almost all have digital Bibles. I don't hear any pages turning. Matthew chapter 8. It's a familiar story. It's the story of Jesus and the disciples on a boat, and they're fearful. I, I want you to see these principles. And it says this, And when he got into the boat, speaking of Jesus, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. Now let's put ourselves in context. The disciples are with Christ, completely obedient to Christ, in the full will of God in this moment, walking with Christ, Christ walking with them. There's no argument there to be had. Furthermore, we can take a step back and be reminded that these disciples, for the most part, most of them were fishermen in their earlier trade. They had been on the boat and in the water most of their life. They had been in many storms. They had navigated many storms. They had worked through many difficult night in a, in a wind that was against them. But here is a storm that is now larger than what apparently they have dealt with before. And the storm is so large that the Bible says that their boat is being swamped. It means water is coming in and the boat is sinking. And they become fearful for their life. Now watch this. Here is a picture of Christians walking with Christ, obedient to Christ, having some skills and set of abilities that should be helpful, but they come to this crisis point in their life 
And when they can no longer, in their own ability, resolve the conflict, fear begins to rise up in their life. And I want you to notice what it says there in verse number 24. It's the last little phrase, and it says, But Jesus was asleep. The storm is raging. The boat is sinking. The disciples are freaking out. They're certain they're going to die. Why are they certain they're going to die? Because they have heard about their colleagues, their friends, family members who had been caught in past storms themselves, and they didn't make it through the night. So they're projecting what had happened in their own past into their present reality for a less than hopeful future. And they're saying, here Jesus is asleep. Now, this is where some of you are in your story. You're in the middle of the storm, and you're like the disciples. You're a little frustrated because you believe that Jesus is simply asleep on your boat. In Mark's gospel of this account, it says that they go to him and they ask him this question, Do you not care that we are dying? And for some of you this morning, if you're really honest with yourself, you have thought at least the same ideals around this. God must be asleep concerning me. God must not care. God is not engaged in my moment. Does God not see what I'm doing? Does God not understand how hard I'm working to keep my family together, my marriage together? I'm a single mom. How in the world am I going to continue to feed my kids at these prices and gases through the roof? And they're talking about a hurricane of economic proportions what in the world are we going to do with this Jesus must be asleep do you not care it's easy to get there but here are the principles in verse number 25 and they went and they woke him saying Lord save us we're perishing Lord We're coming to you and acknowledging we can't save ourselves. Lord, we're facing a storm that is greater than us. Lord, we're fearful. Lord, we're desperate. And for some of you, you're still in the first part of this story and you keep trying to fight the storm and you try keep trying to bell the water and you're trying to navigate the dark night and the winds that are blowing you contrary what it's time to do is to set down your bell bucket and go to the Lord and acknowledge Lord right now my life is sinking and fear has captured my heart and I'm not going to go down with at least calling upon your name and then the second thing happens Jesus asked them to do this. Verse number 6, 26. Why why are you afraid? What's causing this? There it is. What's causing you to be afraid? What's causing you to be afraid today? What's causing your anxiety today? What's chipping away at your faith today? It's not enough just to know I'm afraid, but but the Lord's saying, what's causing this? And and they're like, uh, the the storm. Okay. Now at this point, I want you to look at this because this drives the rest, the last two minutes of this talk. At this point, their eyes had been focused on one thing. Their storm. Verse number 26 continues, and it says, Then Jesus arose, and he rebuked the waves and the sea, and there was great calm. Watch this. And the men no longer feared. They marveled. They marveled. And they said, What? sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him what sort of man is this their focus went away from the something that was bringing fear and they were able to focus on the someone who could give them overwhelming 
peace. Let me give you this great truth. Fear is overcome when your someone is viewed as greater than your something. As long as your something looks greater than your someone, fear will dominate your life. But when you have a moment by which you go to the Lord and you identify your need and you identify your grace, your need for His grace and He begins to rise up over your circumstance and in the midst of your circumstance, what will happen is you'll recognize that the someone who has been with you the whole time is greater than the something that you're trying to fight yourself through in this moment. And I'm trying to get us this morning to lift our eyes to the someone who is greater than the something that you're fighting. He is still able, he is still able to be a man that you stand marveling at. What sort of man is this? Hallelujah be to God. Come on, give the Lord praise if you believe that this morning. When our someone in Christ is viewed as greater than our something that we're facing. Well, how does that happen? Come to the music and I'll close. I'll close if you don't come to the music. Watch this, watch. So how do I get my focus on someone over my something? Where we usually go in this message is this here. We'll just build up your faith. And all of a sudden, you know what we just did? We put it right back on us again. Well, here's the problem. I couldn't get myself out of the storm. And now I'm going to have to build up my faith. to do. Faith is not the opposite of fear. You know what the opposite of fear is? Love. Love. Let me prove it to you in the text because that's all that really matters is what the text says. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. For perfect love cast out all fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of love power and a sound mind. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 beginning with verse 37 and all these things that we face death and disfigurement and all this were more than conquerors through him who loved us for I'm convinced neither life nor death nor principality nor angels nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other thing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from what? The faith of God? No! The love of God. And Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians 13, that beautiful chapter on love, that is not an expression simply as how we are to love one another, but how God loves us. And he says, love never fails. So I'll rest in the love of the Lord evidenced in Christ Jesus. In my anxiety, in my fear, in my uncertainty, I rest in the love. Lord, I'm coming to you. I acknowledge my need of peace and your your grandeur in my life. I realize there's some things that are triggering this and I need your help, Holy Spirit, to navigate around it. But I'm not just looking at one who is almighty and all-powerful. I'm coming to the one who is all loving. And in our text in Isaiah 40, verse number 10, after in verse 8 and 9, he says, You are Israel, my special people. You are Jacob, who I have redeemed. You are Abraham's seed, one in whom I have made an everlasting covenant with. You are the one that I went to the ends of the earth to find, that I would bring you to myself, and I would not cast you off. He says right now, Therefore, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, which means don't look around you anxiously. Why? Because I am your God. I'm a personal God. I'm a near God. And he says, I will strengthen you and I will help you and I will uphold you because it is I who love you. He says, I will hold you with my righteous right hand. How many of you know this is true? And you can remember this moment when your children would get fearful and they were standing next to you almost intuitively. They lift their hand so that you would take their hand. 
so that you, they would know, mama's got me, daddy's got me. And he says, and I'm going to hold you with my righteous right hand. And the moment you lift your hand towards him, you feel the embrace of his righteous right hand who says to you and I, fear not. Fear not.